Good morning, everybody. My name is Mr. Gallivan. I'm the Social Studies Director, and we are privileged to have some special guests here today, um, brought to you by the Kids Voting Stoughton Program, which you guys will hear a lot about in the next couple of weeks leading up to the November 4th election. Although most of you are not uh, old enough to officially vote, uh, all of you are eligible to vote in the Kids Voting Program. Many of you have done it before. Um, we have with us today the, the co-chair, Mrs. Sharon Fradkin, of the Kids Voting uh, Stoughton Program. We also have Ms. Beverly Harris from the Steering Committee. Um, I just want you to clap for me, so I'm on the committee too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we also have two student representatives, two of your, uh, you know, your peers who have put in a lot of time and effort for kids voting. We have Daria Mustova right here, and we have where's Nicole, Nicole Bodette right in front of me. You'll hear more from them in a few minutes. Um, today, of course, we also have our, our uh, rock star in the house, Mr. Jeff Pickett. What we want to talk about today is something that you juniors and seniors have learned about in US too. When you studied the progressive era, you learned that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of voters were upset that they didn't feel that legislators were listening to them and voting on the laws that they wanted voted on. So uh, a reform movement started called initiative and referendum where if you got a certain number of signatures the people could directly put a question on the ballot and on election day depending on how the population voted that question could become the law so you've probably seen signs around during elections vote yes on this vote no on that today we're going to we're going to have a discussion and we're going to hear two sides of the story about question 2 on our ballot for the November 4th election, it is the bottle bill question. So we're fortunate to have two speakers here today. Uh, you're going to listen to both of them, and at the end, you will have a chance to ask questions. So we appreciate, uh, as always, excellent Stoughton High School behavior and manners. And I'd like to first uh, introduce Daria, who's going to introduce our first speaker. Hi everyone. So I'm going to be presenting our pro speaker today, um, Lynn Wilbarst. So she graduated Regis College with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. Um, from Boston University she got her Master's of City Planning and she was the Research Associate in the Neuropsychology Lab of the Boston VA Hospital. Um, she was the editor of the Canton Courier, a weekly newspaper from 1982 to 1984, and she reported on local news and did in-depth stories on environmental topics. Gina McCarthy, now head of the EPA, was the health agent for Canton at that time. She is a member of the Sharon Recycling Committee and Sharon, and Sharon Energy Committee, and she has been a member of the Stoughton League of Women's Voters since 1987. Um, she organized public information forums and speakers on multiple issues including recycling, water quality, and an updated bottle bill. She was the member of the League of Women's Voters in Massachusetts and was on the Legislative Action Committee. She has been an environmental specialist from 2005 until now. I present Lynn Wilbarst. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Because I tend to talk softly and I thought I'd have a mic, but this only goes to cable. Can you hear me? All right, great. Um, Thank you, first of all, for inviting me here today because the bottle bill issue is something that um, I and a whole range of environmental organizations and civic organizations, the League of Women Voters being one of them, has worked on for over a decade uh, to try to update. And I welcome the opportunity to be able to hopefully convince some of you to uh, work on it as well. So. Um, the, the main uh, bottle bill that was passed in 1982, the first bottle bill. And you can go on to the second. Okay. <laughs> and that bottle bill only included carbonated drinks, and carbonated drinks like Coke and Pepsi and beer. 
in malt beverages. And the reason for that was, I don't know if you can guess, in 1982, why would they just have carbonated beverages on the bottle bill? I'll answer my own question. Uh, because bottled water and iced tea and all those on-the-go drinks that we have now did not exist until they weren't invented yet until the mid-90s, um, early to mid-90s, still before many of you were born. But in 1982, they passed the bottle bill for litter, to, to clean up litter. And the litter that was on the ground was what was being sold in stores, and that was beer cans and Coke bottles and Pepsi. And after they passed it, and w the bottle bill at that time was put, putting a nickel deposit which hasn't been raised in 32 years, um, on these containers. And if you took them back, you'd get your nickel back. And once that bill was passed, the litter decreased dramatically. Because when people saw beer bottles or beer cans on the ground, they, they didn't see trash. They saw a nickel, and they would pick them up. So the litter started to disappear. Um, then what happened was the bottled waters and all these new age drinks came into existence slowly in the 1990s. Iced tea, juices, um, energy drinks like Red Bull. And that became slowly the predominant litter. So now when you walk around today, like to a ball field or you know, on the street, you'll see bottled water. You won't see that many beer cans and Coke cans because people and people pick them up and they, they redeem them. Okay, next slide. The reason that we want to update the bottle bill, <clears throat> and updating it means adding all those new drinks that didn't exist in 1982, is because when you put a nickel deposit on a container, the recycling rate goes from 23% when you just have curbside to 80%. And the reason for that is, is because people pick them up. They don't get trashed. They don't get left on the ground. They have a nickel deposit. You know, even if you don't pick them up, somebody else will, and they'll take it back and redeem the nickel. And curbside just doesn't do it. Yeah, we have curbside in about 47% of the towns. The negative ads will tell you differently, but that's the truth. And think about it, even if you have curbside at home, you, when you're out, if you buy a bottled water, when you're in your car, you're not gonna, or if you're in Boston walking around, you're not gonna carry back all the empties to recycle at home. And if there's no recycling bin available, you're gonna you know, put it in the trash. So that's, that's why it goes up when there is a nickel on it. It's the most effective recycling tool we have for containers uh, in Massachusetts, and it still is after 32 years. Okay, next slide. All right, well, because it's so effective, that's why a huge number of people, groups, the coalition um, have been lobbying for over a decade to update the bottle bill the way the way it should be done, through the legislature, because uh, the polls showed over, over the past decade that, a, that about 65 to 70 percent of Massachusetts residents of all political stripes, of all ages, all voting ages, um, all income levels supported the bottle bill. However, for whatever reason, and I think uh, Mr. Phillips is going to explain that to us. Um, it did not pass. And we tried really, really hard. Um, and when I say we, I mean a coalition that involved um, the League of Women Voters in Massachusetts, Environmental League of Massachusetts, the Sierra Club, uh, MassPerg, Audubon, and a, a multitude of local groups. OK. Okay, so when um, a bill can't get passed through the legislature, you have the option of the ballot. But the ballot process is really, really tough. You have to get 
we had to get, we were required to get nearly 100,000 signatures. And we had to get a lot more than that because the signatures have to be on special paper, signature paper, you can't make copies of it. Uh, it, it can't be done online. It has to be old school pen, pencil and paper, pen and paper. Um, it had to be done within, in a six week period. Uh, there are all these rules. And it took hundreds of volunteers and we did it. And, and about 20 something, I, Ted, I don't know if you know that the number, but about 20 something ballot questions were filed, but only four made it to the ballot. That's how hard it is. And we were one of the four. So it was pretty, you know, it took a lot of support uh, to get 130, actually 160,000 in the end signatures is what we collected. And those, those boxes are full of um, paper petitions and they were heavy. And those are uh, the Massburg interns carrying the, uh, them up the hill, Beacon Hill to the State House to uh, hand them into the Secretary of State's office. Okay, next one. Um, this, these are the three main reasons uh, that we want to get the update passed. It effectively does these three things. It stops litter, because people pick up the um, nickel deposit bottles and they leave the other stuff. Uh, it increases recycling, goes up to 80% like we saw before. And those are DEP statistics, Department of Environmental Protection statistics that show those percentages. And it saves um, money for cities and towns. And that, that is about $6.7 million a year. It's about a dollar for every resident in, in every town. And the money spent to pick up litter and to dispose of it. We had, um, when we were trying to uh, get people to sign on to support the bills, we had 209 um, cities and towns sign a pledge. And they didn't just sign it. They had to get it passed usually by their city council or board of selectmen. And, and, and Stoughton signed it. Sharon signed it. Um, 209 cities and towns. And that was with the um, support of all the DPW heads throughout the state. So they're on the side of this as well. And if this bill passed, we would recycle one billion more containers in Massachusetts alone per year. Next slide. So in case you can't picture a billion containers, it, somebody, somebody uh, <laughs> in the coalition did the math. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't know how they did it, but the volume of Fenway Park to the bleacher seats would be filled w with the number of new containers that would be recycled every year if we pass uh, question two. And right now, those are being either trashed or the majority of them are e either being trashed or littered. Um, and they would go into the recycling system if we put a deposit on them. Next slide. Okay. Well, once we got the um, ballot, qu the question on the ballot, we were all happy and we thought, oh, great, we had all this support, 160,000 people signed. We're going to have a tough fight, but everybody knows the bottle bill's good and it's probably going to pass. So you, you know, we'll just have to get the word out. But the no on two side um, has a lot more money than we do. They have $8 million to put into their campaign to kill this. And we have under a million, a few hundred thousand. Um, so they have been flooding the airwaves. I don't, have any of you seen the negative ads or the, the ads for the no on two campaign saying that, oh, curbside's enough and it's an outdated law and all that. That, when we started this campaign, or even a month ago, the support to vote yes was 60% versus 40 no. And, and two weeks of those negative ads have flipped the entire 
uh, thing so that 40% now are voting yes and 60 no, according to the most recent Globe poll. Um, and this just came in last night. Uh, a Tufts University professor that they, they, they know on two sides is relying on to say how much money it's costing Massachusetts if they pass this was paid $7,000 to say that. Um, and then this is another little news clip that uh, Governor Patrick, who used to work for Coca-Cola, uh, was talking to an, an industry associate. They said, not a Coke. Not a, they said, no, not someone from Coke, but um, an old friend. And they told him uh, that the expansion would fail because we have more money than you guys. And they kind of laughed at him, he said. Patrick said. Anyway. Um, so this is the eight million being poured in, and the Globe did a great article uh, about a week and a half ago, and they they actually quoted some of the mistruths, well, the lies <laughs> in the ads, and um, because our coalition asked that those ads be pulled or corrected because they were outright, they were actually breaking the law by. But you can ex you can exaggerate, but you can't outright lie in a in a political ad. So they're not they haven't pulled them yet. But um, this is a video that is on the website for the Yes on Two, our side. And Sharon, if if you click on it, um, I well there should be like a little see the play button on the left. There you go. There should be one more slide at the end. There we go. Okay. Um, this is, I hope you guys will be convinced to um, support this. And if you're not voters, t you can still um, volunteer for this campaign. You can still do things at the local level. You can make calls. Um, you can uh, Talk to your parents. canvas. You can get your parents to vote yes. And I have some cards here that um, you can turn back in with your emails on if you want to get more information on this. So I hope you will. That those of you math students on the bottom um, holding signs, and uh, they're all over it. And that's a cute little kid picking up litter <laughs> in Massachusetts. So I hope that you will. Uh, get the word out and, and get this passed, because if it gets defeated, uh, it's not going to come back up again. It's just, you know, it's, it's, we're going to get killed by big money, and it's not right that um, they can spend $8 million and defeat something uh, with mistruths and lies that uh, groups have been working on for over a decade. Thank you. Good morning. Um, 
I just wanted to mention that the November 4th election is a governor's election and on kids voting, if you are kids voting, all four of the questions will be on the ballot. Um, I know sometimes they haven't been other years, but this year the questions will all be on there. So this is very relevant to what you're going to be voting for. Is there any questions on that? No. Okay. Okay. So Ted Phillips is the staff director of the state representative Lou Kafka of Stoughton, who serves as a chairman for the House of Committee on Steering Policy and Scheduling Events in Massachusetts House of Representatives. Ted has worked for a representative for Kafka for eight years and spent one year working on the Massachusetts Senate before that. Ted is a graduate of Massachusetts University of Massachusetts Amherst and holds a master's degree in public administration from Suffolk University. He lives in Sharon, where he serves on a number of boards and committees. The House of Representatives repeatedly did not expand the bottle bill out of the committee for a t vote, and Ted will address the negatives that held him back. Please welcome to the stage, Ted Phillips. <laughs> All right, let me get a little set up here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, good. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ted Phillips. Um, I am the staff director for State Representative Blue Kafka. I'm here representing the no on question two um, people. First, I want to thank Lynn for her presentation. Um, Lynn has been a very passionate advocate um, for the yes on two uh, folks. And has, as she said, she's been at this for over a decade. I've worked in Representative Kafka's office for eight years. And uh, I've talked to Lynn about this bill for eight years um, as she's come to our office to advocate for it. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the bill never made it through the legislature, which is why it's going to the ballot. Um, the reason that it never made it through the legislature, um, it actually passed the Senate a couple times. Uh, it never got out of the House. Um, anytime the Senate did and send it, sent it over to us, um, the bill e either uh, as a part of a bigger bill, sometimes they attached it to the budget in previous years, sometimes um, they sent it over uh, just as is, as a regular bill, just the bottle bill and only the bottle bill. But it never made it out of, um, out of the House. It actually never came up for a vote uh, in the House uh, because um, in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, we have a pretty uh, strong uh, powers consolidated in the Speaker's office. Um, the Speaker has a lot of power um, in the way he runs the House of Representatives. And the Speaker, uh, in this case, Speaker DeLeo, um, was and is opposed to the bottle bill. Um, so one of the reasons uh, that, you know, the, the major reason that it never came out, one of the reasons that we, um, that we never got a chance to vote on it um, was because adding five cents to products which don't have five cents attached to it, um, money that the government says you have to pay, uh, and then, uh, excuse me, money that the government says that you have to pay, but then uh, you don't, you know, get a choice on whether or not to pay it. What do you guys call that? It's a tax. It's a tax, right? You know, you guys don't, um, because you don't get a choice, the, the, you know, the government says you have to pay extra for something, it's a tax. And so Speaker DeLeo has always made it very clear ever since he became Speaker, and even before that when he was the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, which is the committee that writes the budget, that he didn't want, um, unless he absolutely had to, to introduce any new taxes in Massachusetts. And so because he considered the bottle bill to be a new tax, a tax on, uh, on non-carbonated beverages, it didn't come up. Now, the proponents will tell you that it's not a tax, it's a deposit, because technically you can get that tax back if you come in and, and you return it. But that is a difference of opinion. I think you, you guys would have to settle for yourselves on whether or not you believe it's a tax. Because if you believe it's a tax, if you believe that the government is tacking on a new five cent, you know, a new, a new five cent requirement to your bottle of water, then it's a tax. And then, of course, you have all these representatives who then have to run for office in two years, and every two years, as a matter of fact. And then when they're running for office, a challenger comes up and says, you voted to raise taxes. And they say, well, no, I, you know, maybe they want to say, no, I, I, I just was trying to do the right thing for the environment. Doesn't matter. They're going to say, you voted to raise taxes. And you're going to see some of those commercials go up that says, this guy voted to raise taxes. And so the speaker didn't want to put his members at risk, and that's why the, the vote, uh, the, the bill never came up for a vote. Um, 
So now we find ourselves at the ballot question. Um, once the, um, once the, the proponents have uh, filed with the Attorney General's office, what they do is they, uh, they send in the, uh, the language of the question. The Attorney General has to first sign off on it uh, to see whether or not it uh, is constitutional. Um, in this case, it was determined to be constitutional. Then they have to gather signatures. Um, as Lynn said, something like 130,000 signatures to come up um, have to 130,000 people have to sign on to the bill. Um, those signatures have to be submitted, verified, and now it's on the ballot. So uh, now that it's on the ballot, uh, the no on two people um, who uh, represent, who are a lot of businesses in Massachusetts, say, you know, have come out, they're running ads, um, a lot of advertising, as a matter of fact. Raise your hand if you've seen an advertising for no on two. Oh, really? You guys don't watch enough TV. It's all over the place. I mean, on the local news, it's everywhere. But um, so they're running a, a lot of ads. Um, and the facts are a little exaggerated, but they're not far off base. As Lynn said, that um, you know, the amount of curbside recycling is actually closer to 47% of towns in Massachusetts have curbside recycling. The ad said 90 because in, uh, according to the, the no on two people, um, 90% of Massachusetts towns have some form of community recycling. Should we have said curbside? Probably not. We probably should have just said you have access to a community program. So there's a drop off, uh, a drop off place in some of these towns that don't do curbside. Um, so that's, I think that's where the, uh, where the 90% was meant to represent. Maybe it was a little bit of a stretch in the commercial, but that's, that's what um, the no on two people uh, were trying to say. Um, the second thing about you know the politicians getting to keep your money, um, well, if you don't return the deposit, the deposit has to go somewhere. Um, it will go into a fund um, that will that is slated under under the bottle bill. Um, the fund is slated for uh, environmental purposes. Uh, the The fund that is established by the expansion of the bottle bill is supposed to go towards um, you know better environmental um, you know, initiatives across Massachusetts. But as we've seen in the past, sometimes when money is tight, um, the, the legislature, um, when they are spending the money, um, have gone to all different, they look at all the funds and they say, oh, there's money in this fund, we could, we could use this for, for something else, maybe something that they feel like is more important. So um, I think, again, when they say the politicians get to keep your money, well, no, but they could eventually come after it. So it's that that possibility is is out there. Um, finally, um, did anybody read the text of question two before they before they came today? Yes, you guys all read through it. Okay, so how many of you guys are familiar with section five, which amends section three hundred and twenty-two of Mass General Laws, chapter ninety-four? No. Oh, you read the summary. Okay. So if you go to Section 5, it says that um, every five years, the Secretary of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs shall review the refund value as referenced in the law and adjust said amount to the nearest whole cent to reflect the consumer price index as reported by the United States Department of Labor, but in no case shall the refund value be less than five cents. That means that in five years, if this bill passes, in five years, the Secretary of Environmental Affairs, who we don't know who it's going to be, could be a Republican, could be a Democrat, could be an independent. We don't know who the governor is going to be in five years. We don't know who the secretary is going to be in five years. Has to go back to this, has to go back to the bottle bill and review it. And if the consumer price index, which is um, tied to inflation, the inflation of the money, has gone up, then they are supposed to raise the amount, uh, let's say, to the nearest whole cent um, to reflect that price index. So in five years, if inflation's gone up, we don't know if it will, if inflation's gone up, the deposit could go up. So it could go up to six cents in five years. If there's a lot of inflation, it could go up to seven or eight. 
the point is, is that moving forward, we don't know how much it's actually going to be and how much it's actually going to cost. And because we don't know a lot of those costs, um, that was another reason why the House was a little bit skittish on, on passing this and the reason why they, they, you know, they didn't want to um, put it into law. So, uh, you know, another point um, uh, that uh, the no on two people make um, are we don't know the costs that it's going to be to businesses. Uh, if you sell uh, the, if you sell non-carbonated beverages, well, right now, if you sell carbonated beverages, if you sell soda and you sell beer, then we good. Okay, just checking. If you sell soda and you sell beer, you have to take those bottles back. Those those retailers are required to take them back. So now, if you sell, um, you know, juice, uh, water. Uh, sports drinks, things like that, you have to, you, the, those retailers will now have to take them back as well. Okay. Uh, you have to take, they will have to take those back. And obviously this, uh, you know, is concerning to some smaller businesses um, because once you have to start taking those back and you have to return them, it's a forced deposit return, um, it, it piles up. I mean, you could have bags and bags of these things um, at, at small restaurants, at small pizza shops and things like that. Now, you can apply under the text of question two, you can apply for a waiver, but there's no guarantee that you get that waiver. So, you know, we're, you know, we're concerned a little bit that you can, um, you know, that small businesses might apply for the waiver and not get the waiver uh, and then have, you know, their, you know, basically the back room just completely stacked with bottles because they have to take them back. Um, so in an effort to you know, not, uh, not burden businesses even further um, than we already do in Massachusetts, that was another reason why, um, why we didn't want to, uh, to move forward with it. So what I'm trying to say is we all want to do more recycling. We all think more recycling is a good idea. Um, the problem is, is that there's a lot of unknowns about question two, if you know when you pass it, what happens moving forward? You know we don't know if prices will go up. We don't know if uh, you know we don't know if the bottle of Poland Springs, which costs a dollar right now, moves to a dollar and five, or if Poland Springs or whoever the retailer is just tries to absorb that cost in. They they haven't made that particularly clear. Um, so a lot of people uh, feel like that there are just too many questions. Um, too many questions about the question. You know, there's um, there's a lot of unknowns that uh, we we just feel like it is too risky because we don't know what's going to happen. We do know that recycling is up since 1983 when the initial bottle bill was passed. Uh, we know that uh, that you know recycling it, it's certainly better. Um, could it be could it be better than than it is now? Yes, absolutely. There's always uh, good work to be done. But uh, a lot of people who are voting no on two just feel like it's going to happen on its own. It doesn't need to be forced like it was in 1982 when the place was really much more of a mess. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. OK, so now here's the part where you guys get involved. If you have questions that you would like one of our speakers or both of our speakers to answer, what we're going to ask you to do is, is stand up, and when you're recognized, uh, ask your question in a loud voice so as many people as possible can hear it. And if uh, the speaker who's answering the question could kind of rephrase the question so everyone hears it and, and uh, people at home, thousands of people at home, Jeff? Millions. Millions, millions of people at home watching Stoughton Cable. Um, who would like to start with the first question? Yes, you can. Okay. Who's it for? Um, both. Please. Okay. Both. Um, if the yes goes through on this vote, how quickly will we see a change? Um, the law is supposed to go into effect almost immediately, which would mean next year. You probably have the exact I think date. I do. Ted, That's a good question. You? Let's see. Yep. Did, did you say it? Somebody read the bill yep. all the way through. Oh, I'm impressed. You should repeat the 
Okay, the, the question is, if this law passes, how soon will it go into effect? And it is uh, on April 22nd, 2015, which somebody in the front row here knew, which means they read the entire text of the bill, which is really impressive. They not only read it, but remembered it. I'm impressed. So basically what that means um, is that if the effect date is April 22nd, it means that um, on April 22nd, that is the date when you can start, thank you, um, when you can start turning those bottles back in. Um, April 22nd, it, it also gives the businesses time. Like, like I said, those small businesses will have to apply for those waivers. Um, gives, it should give uh, the uh, Department of, I think it's um, Energy, and uh, the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs who will administ uh, administer the program time to look at those waivers and um, our waiver applications, grant them, not grant them. Uh, but yeah, April 22nd, 2015 is the effective date of the law. Can I just say something? Uh, the, the small business part of it, those waivers are for all, I thought they were pretty much automatic for all businesses, all businesses that have less than 4,000 square feet, which is pretty, pretty big. Uh, that's exempting their storage area um, are, are, don't have to take back the empties. And that was, that was something that was changed from the original bill because I think actually Representative Kafka complained to me about it and I went back and we, you know, they worked it out and put in that 4,000 square feet or under, you're a small business that doesn't have to take back the empties. They have to go back to some big grocery store. Okay, so yes, the um, the small business they do actually have to apply for the waiver, but the law does does define um, small business as um, uh, people with a contiguous retail space of three thousand square feet or less, excluding office and stockroom space, and fewer than four locations under the same ownership of the Commonwealth. So. Um, Again, it, it defines small dealer and it says they can seek the exemption. However, if they don't seek the exemption, if they don't know to seek the exemption, um, then they have to apply by, they have to apply by, or conform, um, conform with the provisions of the law. They have to follow the law unless they go out and seek the exemption. Okay. I have a question for you. Uh, do you recycle? Do I recycle? I do, as a matter of fact. It, I, um, I live uh, right next door in Sharon. Uh, Sharon, we have a curbside recycling program. Um, so uh, I do recycle all of my uh, bottles and cans. Uh, in fact, uh, more often than not, I'm quite frequently rather lazy. And instead of going back to the deposit, I just throw my soda, my soda cans right in the uh, curbside recycling because they take that too. Um, I used to live in Sharon. I just moved from there. And um, I, so I had the same kind of recycling that Ted did. And I moved recently to an apartment in Quincy, downsized. And it's an 18 unit apartment. And I didn't have time to put this up today, but I took a picture of what they have for recycling at this apartment building, which is a problem all over the state that apartments don't usually have recycling um, accessible. And it was a 60 gallon, one 60 gallon recycling bin. And somebody had put it, a, a big cardboard ba box next to it because it was overflowing with water bottles because people were trying to recycle but they just didn't have the room. And that's one of the problems and this bill would take care of it. And the other thing that I wanted to say was, um, I'm sorry, it's in reference to the, um, never mind, I'll, I'll think of it later, okay. here we go. <laughs> Next question. I have a question for um, Wolbarst. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to ask what's, what's really the main point of the bottle bill? Is it more towards uh, revenue from unclaimed bottles and cans and such that people will forget to or won't? Uh, is it that that will generate more revenue? Or is so just for people following along at home, um, the question was what uh, the main purpose of the bottle bill is. Is it to, is it to increase recycling or is it to uh, increase revenue to go towards environmental projects? Does that sound about right? Okay. 
Hi. The, the main point is to clean up parks, to decrease litter, and increase recycling, which is kind of the same thing. And as I said before in the PowerPoint, uh, the recycling rate for the deposit bottles goes up to 80%. So then you've only got like 20% left or unredeemed. And that's the money that goes into the fund. So it's 80% getting brought back or recycled, and the 20% goes into that fund. And what happened, I know um, Ted referred to the politicians. You know, it can get used by the politicians for whatever they want. What happened is the initial bottle bill had a clean environment fund. So those unused nickels would go back to the state into this clean environment fund. It was only used for recycling and clean up and, and improving recycling. What happened is during the Romney administration, they saw that fund and it was several million dollars and they wanted it, so they put it back into the general fund. And this law would recreate the clean, uh, clean environment fund and, and make sure that those nickels were used for recycling and cleaning up parks. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. The question is, uh, if the if five cents worked for thirty years um, as the initial bottle bill, why in five years would you need to to reevaluate? And that's part of the thing that the the no on the no on two people are saying. Why do, why would you need to reevaluate? Because it's been five cents. Why wouldn't you know? Even if even if it did go through, why wouldn't you just keep it at five cents? But there is a clause that says that you know you have to that the Secretary of Environmental Affairs has to go back and look at it, which is making people a little bit nervous that this is the start of the, the deposits going up in the future. OK. Um, for 32 years, it's been a nickel. Now, a nickel back in 1982, and I remember I worked on the first bottle bill mold, um, was uh, back then, I, I didn't look it up, but I, I'm sure Coke was under 50 cents a can or a bottle. Okay, so that nickel represented about 10% of the cost, and people paid it, you know, the deposit, and they took them back, and it was a real incentive back then. Now, a nickel, you know, it's becoming less and less of an incentive for people because it hasn't risen at all with inflation in 32 years. Now, what is it? A bottle of Coke or a bottle of water, right? Over a dollar. So, by those rights, it should really be a dime. But all this bill is asking for is that every five years, the consumer CPI, Consumer Price Index, gets looked at by the Secretary uh, the, uh, of Environmental Affairs and Energy. And he, he has discretion to either raise it or not. Um, over time, I think the CPI goes up about 2% a year. Some, some years it goes down a little, other years it goes up, but it averages about 2%. Uh, so the, most it might be, have gone up is 10% in, in five years. And that would be, on a 5% on a deposit, it would be half, half a cent. So they could or could not raise it to six, you know, the nearest cent. But it might be less. And, then, and it would stay the same for the next five years. So it's not like this out of control um, cost increase. It's really just like keeping up with inflation, and it's really lower than it should be to get people to pick them up off the ground. It takes 20 bottles to make a dollar, you know? So it's, <laughs> it's not as much of an incentive as a dollar was back in uh, 82. Yes, in the back. So the question was, is there a maximum, the maximum. for how much the deposit can be increased? Um, not as defined in the question. You know, it says it implements a five cent on everything, and then it says it has to be reevaluated every five years, could go up. But it's a, it actually says it can't go down. I should say that. Um, because it says the refund shall, um, go down. in no case shall the refund value be less than five cents. So in other words, it sets a, it sets a floor, but it doesn't set a ceiling. 
And if you look at the past 32 years, you'll see that there's a reluctance by the, you know, the secretary that has the discretion to raise it ever. It's not necessarily a popular thing. So they could decide, even if the CPI does increase, not to raise it in five years. Sure. Um, I just, can I, okay, do we have any more questions? I'm, I was going to. Um, I have another question for Ted. Yeah. Um, do you think, like, you honestly think without any incentive, people are going to start recycling, like you said, that if they aren't recycling already? Do you, I, um, I think that. Sure, if there is money to be made, there's obviously going to be people who can t who will take advantage of it. Um, yeah, no, no, I mean, but like without an incentive, do you think that people would actually start recycling just out of the goodness of their heart? <laughs> I think that the statistics show that since 1983, recycling rates have gone up. Is that it, for for all for in, in all shapes and sizes? Um, is that directly because of you know? Uh, is that because of the bottle bill, which was only on the carbonated beverages? I can't say for certain. I, you know, I think that some people will. I mean, I go through, you know, uh, uh, I see uh, sometimes if you go to, like, to the high school gym after, uh, after a volleyball game, say, um, you'll notice that there is a lot of bottles that have been just left around for the janitors, um, who, you know, that are Gatorade bottles, water bottles, um, that haven't been recycled. Um, will the new, you know, will, will expanding the law ta uh, cause them to recycle? Uh, maybe. Um, but, uh, you know, I think whenever there's a financial incentive, it helps. Uh, but there are sometimes, there are some cases where people, yes, you know, people who are environmentally conscious want to do the right thing. And I think there are more of them now than, we are more environmentally conscious now than we used to be. Um, you know, will that trend continue, uh, you know, or have we sort of planed off and, you know, need something to spike it again? That's a good question. I'm, I'm not too sure. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that it won't happen. I, I call me a cynic, but my background's in city planning, and um, money works. Money incentives work. The goodness of your heart. I mean, there are more environmentalists now than there were in 1982. Mm -hmm. um, you and I are probably two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're still in the minority. And even even the people that are environmentalists, you know, don't have if they don't have a recycling bin when they're in Boston, they're going to put it in the trash. They're going to carry all their empties around with them forever. Um, I I just wanted to to illustrate the point with a story, and they know, they know how this works because it's passed in other states, like Connecticut, New York, and California. So, so we, it's not like a new thing that Massachusetts, new groundbreaking thing that Massachusetts is doing. What happens with these bottles at the ballparks or in the gym is that um, you see people donating them. Like, they'll, they'll save them for the sports team, and they'll go back and redeem them. Or they'll say, the Boy Scouts love this. They had Boy Scouts testify at one of the hearings at the State House. There's some team, a uh, Boy Scout troop up on the North Shore that's making like thousands of dollars a year just doing, you know, having people donate their carbonated nickel deposit containers. So that's what happens in other states. Like, I might throw a bottle of water in my recycling bin now, but if I knew, like, the Boy Scouts wanted it, I'd just save them in a bag and give them to the Boy Scouts. And being the, the geek that I am, uh, about four years ago, um, a group of us in Sharon uh, wanted to illustrate the fact that containers on the ground are now more non-deposit than deposit. So we went around one Sunday morning around Lake Massapog and we picked up 617 containers in just a couple of hours. Yeah, and, um, and then uh, we counted them out and sort them into deposit and non-deposit, non and we had four bags of non-deposit bottled water, iced tea, all that, and two bags. Of, it was about 60% to 40%, 60-something um, percent non-deposit to 40% deposit. And the deposit ones were a lot of beer cans in the woods that the kids aren't going to take home and recycle. So. <laughs> So it really illustrated the fact that, you know, 
if, if all those had a deposit on them, there wouldn't be that much litter. Uh, you mean like the no, like the sh the raw number? Yeah. Does any, like, well, the it's a billion, a billion, a billion bottles per year. And we think that would be That's eighty percent of um, the, the the of the, the sales uh, of yeah. It's eighty percent of the number of it's something like one point three billion. I don't. I can't do the math in my head, but okay. that of non-carbonated be beverages that would fall within the universe of this bill. And then they just multiply that by 80% and they got a billion a year in Massachusetts. Enough to fill Fenway Park to the brim. Hi. Um, so I was reading in the voter information section that one of the arguments that the no camp says is that Massachusetts should lead the way in recycling and not um, support an outdated uh, initiative. So I guess my question is, what's currently being considered in the House right now? Like, what bills are there that would push, you know, an environmental agenda, like that would increase littering, et cetera? Are there things right now that the House are considering that, you know, would do something about littering if this doesn't get passed? It's a very good question. Um, I don't have uh, bills off the top of my head. We have uh, uh, in that in the House we have a committee on uh, environment, uh, natural resources, and agriculture um, that um, uh, see, that considers approximately I want to say a couple hundred bills every two years um, uh, get referred to their committee um, having to do with um, ways to improve. Uh, uh, not, not all of them, obviously, to do with recycling. It, obviously, it's a very broad spectrum, but there are a number of recycling bills um, that do get filed. A lot of them um, are uh, somewhat aggressive, I think, um, in terms of mandating. You know, some some legislators want to mandate curbside recycling, you know, across the Commonwealth, and um, you know, other legislators have have put forward proposals um, to uh, to aggressively increase recycling. Um, will those get considered any more or any less, um, whether or not the bottle bill uh, passes? Um, I, I, I've not heard any, any um, positioning from uh, leadership uh, that says, you know, if this, goes, if this question goes down, we'll, we'll take another look at those. I can't, um, I can't tell you with any certainty. Um, you know, those bills may be, you know, considered uh, in the future. You know, again, based on the merits, but um, there has been no um, there has been no effort to come out and say, you know, you guys vote this down and, and don't worry, we'll take care of it this way. Yeah. So there's no there's no alternative that is, you know, sitting there waiting for us to go get it. One may be created, um, you know, if the you know we if if the no on two people, um, you know, would would offer it in. You know, go that way. It, does that make sense? Yeah, I just wonder. You know, the whole the ads that keep saying, you know, we're going to lead the way in re in recycling. I'm wondering, like, what is the plan then? Like, what is, you know? Yeah, I think it. You know, it the leadership um, in environmental issues, um, Massachusetts. They are uh, the the advertisements speak broadly. They paint with very broad strokes, and we uh, we do pride ourselves in Massachusetts on being a leader um, in terms of green technology, um, being more uh, environmentally friendly than other states. Um, again, this is very broad, and so by you know when you say Massachusetts is a leader in environmental issues. Um, you can make the argument that recycling is part of that environmental um, leadership. 
Um, but we may not, you know, when it boils down to it on, you know, are we number one in recycling rates, I don't have that data. Lynn might. Um, no, I, I don't have that data either. I, I don't think we're number one in, in recycling rates. Um, you know, from the curbside, the curbside is, is 20 to 23 percent. Uh, what I do know is, and, and I, don't, I don't think it uh, came out of the, of the committee, but Senator Moore has a bill to repeal the in, entire bottle bill, even the old one that we have. And that, this, this new, the bottle bill itself costs big beverage money because they have to pay to take back the, 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 you know, the plastics and the, the aluminum and everything. And they, they make a huge profit margins on, on a bottle of water, can of Coke, and it's cutting into their profit margins. It's not costing them money. It's not, you know, meaning that they're not making a profit. And so that's, they don't even like the bottle bill that we have. And this is driving them crazy. That's why they're putting eight million in to defeat it, because they don't want it to pass in Massachusetts and then spread to other states. They, they, fought, they fought it, bottle bills in states all over the country, and a lot of the eight million is from out of state. But anyway, um, I digress. <laughs> there is a bill to repeal the entire bottle bill, and if this gets defeated, uh, I think that the opposition will be emboldened to then repeal the bottle bill itself, which they would have you believe is an old-fashioned, outmoded uh, way of doing things. But you know, democracy has been around for a long time too, but it still works. And this, uh, the bottle bill works. Yeah. So the commercials, the commercials, obviously, you know, in, in political advertising, um, and this is political advertising, um, there are always um, claims that are perhaps uh, have some fact behind it, but those facts get stretched. So uh, in other words, one of the, um, the, you know, the two claims that was referenced by the yes um, people in the presentation, uh, the first the first claim was the access to recycling and so um, the the original commercial said ninety percent of communities in Massachusetts have access to uh, I think they did they said they said curbside right in the ad yeah, they said okay curbside. they said curbside what they should have said what they should have said is ninety percent have access to community recycling programs curbsides curbsides forty seven um, there was a bit of a jump there, but obviously when you're, when you're doing political advertising, 90% sounds a lot better if you're trying to make the, the no case. Um, so uh, no one too got called out on that. And as a matter of fact, if you look at those commercials now, when you see the commercials, there will be a little disclaimer as that goes up. And, actually, and the disclaimer says, actually 47% curbside, 90% community recycling programs. So. Um, Maybe got caught a little bit overreaching on that one. And in terms of the the politicians get to keep your keep your money, um, it's basing it off of what uh, what Lynn said happened during the Romney administration, in which there was a fund, it got raided um, when money got tight, um, and there is nothing in I don't think there was anything in the language. I was going through the the language of the question. There was nothing to to keep the legislature from raiding it again. So you know, what the no on two people are saying, it's happened before, it's likely to happen again. Maybe, maybe not, but that's, you know, that's where the leap comes from. So, you know, it's sort of, it's based, it, the, the ad takes a very, you know, a very small fact and then stretches it. Um, there was, you know, as, as you saw, um, the yes on two people were were very upset with those with those um, commercials. They asked uh, people to, they asked stations to take them down. Um, Bill Fine, who's the uh, general manager for Channel Five, actually responded and said, "Listen, this is you know what passes for political advertising these days, and you know they're they're paying us to to run the ads, and um, we don't feel that we have a responsibility to take them down. We you know 
the yes on two people have a responsibility to get their message out better or do you know do more to um, to refute the claims if you know if you're going to say it's wrong tell us why and so that you know again you got the disclaimer in there for the um, for the for the 47 versus the 90 percent the the political um, the question of whether or not um, the money could get used for other purposes um, you know is based on it happening before and could happen again um, so that's why the ads haven't been fully pulled. Does that, does that make sense to answer your question? Okay. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that um, our side is never going to raise $8 million or anywhere near it by little, small, grassroots donations. And the only way that we can win on November 4th is if people like you get the word out. If you know, it's got to be a grassroots effort, it's got to be more people against the money because it's a real David and Goliath fight. So if you are at all concerned about this issue and you want more recycling and less litter, uh, please do something. I have some cards that um, I hope you will take at the end of this and uh, think about doing something before November 4th because we only have 24 more days till the election. I mean, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is also one of the things that, you know, uh, with ballot questions, it, it's a challenge. You know, when it, it's, you know, getting a ballot question passed in Massachusetts, there are a lot of hurdles. And you have the hurdles that we talked about earlier, getting, collecting signatures and doing all the things to get it on the ballot. But then, you know, as Lynn said, you run up against some pretty well-funded interests who, you know, the reason the, the, the question, you know, didn't get passed was because there were a lot of people opposed to it. Uh, and there are a lot of people with very deep pockets who are opposed to it now. And you're seeing sort of that play out because, um, as, as Lynn said, it's, it, in, with, with some of these questions, it's a David versus Goliath. You know, it's, it's an uphill fight all the way to November 4th. It's not, you know, it's not a fight just to get it on the ballot and then everybody's just supposed to understand it. It's a complex issue. So as you, know, as the, as you get to November 4th, you have to keep informing yourself and learning more about it and, and trying to uh, get as many facts as possible so that you can make an informed decision and not a decision that's based on commercials. Yeah. So you feel that because your campaign had more money, that you have a better opportunity to convince the voters to vote for your side just because of the fact that you can get more time on TV where they can't have that because they don't have the same money The no on two people feel like, you know, that the, you know, no one too feels that it's that the question is a bad idea, um, and it, it's not particularly. Uh, I don't want to say it's not our fault, but no one too has a lot of money, and because we believe that it's that it's a bad question, we're going to spend that money to make sure that as many people are aware of our position. Uh, as we possibly can. And this day and age, that's TV advertising. Um, you know, word of mouth helps, um, but, you know, TV advertising is the way to, to, to fight a political campaign these days. And, you know, yeah, we, the, no one too has deep pockets, no question about it. But um, that doesn't mean that, you know, does that mean that we shouldn't spend the money to get our message out? I mean, it's one of those, if you, if you got it, you know, you have an advantage in the fight, you should use the advantage. I mean, that's like campaign 101. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm sort of like a comment with a question at the end. Shoot. Um, I'm not like saying that you shouldn't spend the money that you have, but don't you think that like throwing so much money at a campaign sort of like undermines like the idea of like government by the people for the people when like those that don't have enough money don't have the same voice? So the question was is that, you know, is there sort of a social responsibility um, involved with, um, you know, spending that kind of money and uh, when your opponent is so uh, outmatched financially, right? Um, so uh, if short, I was going to say short answer, you, you know, you use the tools in the toolbox. Um, so the, you know, no one too feels that this is a, this is a bad question. This question should should fail, you don't want to be left, um, you know, with all, the, with all the different companies that are contributing to this effort and all the different companies that say, we really think this is a bad idea, we really think it's a terrible policy and we don't want, uh, we don't want it passed in Massachusetts. And here's a check for, you know, $2 million to go fight it. 
you don't want to be going back to them and saying, you know, I know you gave me $2 million to fight it, but I felt really bad for the other guy. So I spent like 300000 and they won. So, you know, now you're, you know, now as a business, you're going to, um, you're going to have to pay a little bit more and, you know, I'm going to eat into your profit margin. Even though you gave me a lot of money, I, you know, I felt bad. So I didn't, I didn't really spend it. I think, you know, the people who, you know, have, who are investing the resources expect to see those resources used to get their message out um, and to blanket, um, to blanket the airwaves, you know, do a media blitz, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, it, um, does it hurt democracy? Um, I think that's a much longer philosophical question that would probably require at least another two periods. So, uh, I'll, I'll put it there, but I'll let Lynn sound off on that as well. Hi. Um, yes, it does hurt democracy. Uh, the League of Women Voters uh, tagline is League of Women Voters Making Democracy Work. And I think this issue is a poster child for democracy being broken because we tried and the League has always wanted to go through traditional channels and get it passed through the legislature. Your representatives and your senators are elected to represent you. and all, we had people lobbying and a majority of people lobbying the majority of the representatives from all over the state and we just still couldn't get it passed the right way. And so we had to do all this work and now we're up against all this money. And I just want to say that there's, and, and I'm not going to go into a whole discourse on money and politics, but it's gotten much worse in the last four years uh, from the Citizens United decision, which basically said that money is speech and that corporations, like people, have the right to free speech. And it really just opened up the floodgates to unlimited spending in elections, which covers ballot questions. So you can basically kill anything if you have enough money, is what it's come down to. And <clears throat> the move to amend people, because you have to get an amendment to uh, we would have to get an amendment to the Constitution to undo the bad Citizens United uh, Supreme Court decision, are working hand in hand with us. Uh, they've, you know, they, they're, they're all over this because this is like a prime example of what they're fighting, the money in politics. And um, I just, you know, I just wanted you to know that this is an example. If you, if you, who are you going to believe? On one side, on the yes side, are the League of Women Voters, every major environmental group in the state, uh, the Department of Environmental, the State Department of Environmental Protection, 209 municipalities that signed a pledge, um, and on the other side is Big Beverage, uh, you know, all out-of-state corporations, uh, big supermarket chains, liquor stores. Uh, who are you going to believe? Got okay, a question? Yep. Um, I know you said you live in Sharon, that you used to live in Sharon. Um, I work at Test Care Chicken, and our milk bottles have the $2 deposit on them. Mm -hmm. And I have worked there a little under two years. I've never heard anyone say anything negative about it. I was just wondering if you said that two weeks ago, the, after their ads started airing, it kind of like flipped the tables on who had the upper hand. Do you think that was because of their ads? And like, do you think that it actually, or like, on your side, do you believe that people actually don't, wouldn't agree with paying that money if they were there? Uh, the $2? No, or the, on, for the bottle. Oh, for the bottle. Um, well, y Crescent Ridge is um, unique, right, in that that's just their deposit that yeah. they made up. And for the record, um, this this law does not involve um, any milk products. Yeah, I'm just saying people seem, like, so in favor of that every time they talk about it. Oh, do you when, believe that people are actually in favor of your bill, or do you think, and like, because of his ad, their size advertisements, that's why the tables have turned, or do you think that people actually are starting to think that, oh, maybe this isn't a good idea? Oh, well, that, that's what the ads have convinced them. They've flipped people that were in favor of it, that thought they knew the facts, and they, they, they've made them uncertain. I mean, people in my own family were coming up to me at a family party last weekend going, hey, Lynn, I saw the ad on TV, and... Uh, What's, you know, what is it with the, you know, the politicians are going to get our money? And it was like really discouraging because, yes, the money and the, the two weeks of ads have totally flipped from 60-40 in favor to 60-40 um, against. 
Um, <clears throat> there's no question the ads have worked. Um, you know, as Lynn said, it was it was 60-40 in favor of the bottle bill um, when I think it was the Globe first did their poll um, in the two weeks since the ads have started to run. Uh, that has been flipped to 40-60 in terms of the support versus the opposition. So um, is that a question of, you know, us doing a better job of getting our message out? Um, that it's hard to say because it's, it's you know, the the question is, were people paying attention two weeks ago? Um, and or were people not paying attention two weeks ago? Now they are and they think it's a bad idea. Or were they, you know, were they paying attention and they had their their mind slipped? It's it's always tough because you know those part of the some of the you know the the polls when they do that um, don't necessarily go into the reasons why. Um, we know that they're having an effect. You know we know that the that the ads um, have you know have had a, a, a have boosted uh, boosted the the no campaign, um, but you know I'm not sure because we don't know what the starting point was. You know if if you know, people just weren't particularly, um, you know, paying attention or if they were, you know, or if they were paying attention, something changed their mind. It's, it, you know, chicken and the egg type of thing. Oh, we have three hands. <laughs> Professor Galvin, it's up to you. So you're saying if, if Lynn's side has had as, mu had as much money as my side, would it be different? I would. Yeah, I mean, obviously it would be different. I mean, I don't think that um, in just a, a, at a very general level um, to have a 40-point swing in two weeks um, is obviously because one side is is you know the one side's message is is perhaps getting through better than the other side. Um, would it be completely flipped? Tough to say. Uh, it would certainly be closer than it is now. Fair? Fair. 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 Much, much closer. All right, maybe one more question. Okay. <laughs> so you earlier said that you were head of like, budget planning. No, I, I um, am the uh, staff director for Representative Kafka. I've worked in his office. I do, so I do work on um, you know, his budget priorities and things like that. The Ways and Means Committee in the House is the committee that writes the budget. No, what, we're, what, we're, what the no on two people are saying is that um, in the past, uh, when you know this environmental fund was had a very healthy balance, had a lot of money in it, um, and you know times were tight. In the past, the legislature has dipped into that fund in order to cover other expenses, or they've used that to you know spend more um, you know to cover some of the priorities. Uh, for the environment that were already being funded by other parts of the budget, and then they re they reallocated those you know the environmental stuff um, from other parts of the budget to cover more pressing expenditures. That's it's not that we don't uh, trust them to do it. We're the the no on two people are saying we've seen it happen before. We think it could happen again. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for your uh, attention, and I thought the questions were excellent.